green. Uh, while we're hearing that song, the on live stream doesn't get to hear that because of copyrights. Uh, we can't send, send that out. So, uh, so pe people don't know why I get tickled each time I come up here. <clears throat> so while they're finding uh, Mike and Ginger Green, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you we can come into God's house and experience the Spirit of God. Ministering out of the Word of God, make the printed page become the living page within our lives. And Lord, we thank you at this time when we're starting to celebrate Jesus Christ, the birth of our Savior. Let us have a great month. Let it be a rejoicing month because we're thankful for you and all that you did. So bless each and every person here today. Bless those on live stream. Let everyone hear God for their lives. In Christ's name, amen. Can we find Mike and Ginger Green? Okay, if you find it, I'll keep watching. Uh, well, meanwhile, uh, I'm going to uh, apologize. Matt, uh, I know your name. I called you the wrong name a couple of weeks ago. I, I just want to make a public apology. Matt and Teresa, everybody, okay? We need to learn people's names, especially the pastor. Okay, so God bless you both. Okay, uh, there's Mike and Ginger Green. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, they will be here next week. And uh, uh, we're moving Hot Dog Sunday from this Sunday to next Sunday so we can go up afterwards and have fellowship with them. They're the couple that we support or we send the money to to build the houses in Honduras. So Matt and Ginger will... No, there we go again. Mike and Ginger will... <laughs> Sorry, Mike. <clears throat> And Ginger will be here next week, so make sure you're here for that, because all of you have invested uh, in, in that ministry, and uh, they're good people. You'll want to uh, speak with them. I also want to say behind every Christmas decoration around the world, every light that's lit, I believe, represents the light of the world, Jesus Christ. Every present that's given it yeah, represents the, the ultimate gift of Jesus Christ. And, and so up here on the platform, this is my idea, I hope you like it, uh, behind every Christmas wreath, decoration, you name it, Christmas tree, there's a love of God shown in Jesus Christ. So if you'll turn your Bibles to John 15, 5 through 8. I am the vine, and you are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings more, much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abides in me, now catch that, if a man abides in me, and he, can, he is cast forth as a, not abide in me, he's cast forth as a branch and withers. And men gather them, and they cast them into the fire, and they are burned. All right, catch number seven. This is, this is the uh, issue I want to bring out. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it will be done unto you because you will be led by the Spirit of God. Verse eight. In this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. So the whole key there is verse seven if you abide in me, and if my words abide in you, otherwise he's with you, you're with him, he's in you. When you ask Jesus Christ into your life, you have that born spiritually experience, and you hear God, and then we constantly listen for God, we abide with him in the word of God. So how do you abide? How do we remain stable and fixed in our relationship with God? How do we endure natural temptations and desires of the flesh and self-will? By staying in a constant relationship with Jesus Christ. And people, the only two ways you can do that to ground yourself is by staying in the Word of God and talking to God as well as hearing God. So a relationship that conforms and accepts without objection to the Word of God. It's called transformation in Christ. And otherwise, we're, going, we're trying to be more spiritual than the natural. 
And so when we're abiding in Him, and that's the key word here, when we're abiding in His Word, listen to this. There is a Bible verse for every situation in your life. And as you learn the Word of God, God will quicken that to you. This is the verse you ought to be using. This is the verse for you to stand on. This is the verse for you to step out. This is the verse how to speak. This is the verse how to act. The Word of God covers every, every, every aspect of our life. And the Word comes alive. It's He in us and we in Him. He comes alive when we abide in Him. He tells us the secrets of our hearts. He tells us our secret and personal, special and personal thoughts. He encourages us. He gives us insight. He guides us. He also corrects us into all good things. Every time we're abiding in Him in prayer and reading the Word, and then an issue comes in our life, the Word is quickened to us, we respond to it, it's always unto all good things. And that is when we hear His call. Now I want to talk about the call because we have the Greens coming next week. And they heard the call and they went to Honduras. But the call in our life can be momentarily. It's a call to respond a certain way. Or it can be for a season. God gives you an insight, and for a season, that's what you're supposed to do. And then there'll be another word and another season. Or there's also an overall call that you know what your life mission is. See, the call can be intimidating. It can be scary. Now, the call can say, stand up to that person, talk to your boss, or talk to your relative, or talk... See, it can be scary, it can even be terrifying to some people, but have no fear, God is there. He has called you because He knows He can trust you. If He's speaking to you, He knows, here's the opportunity, take it, that's why I'm talking with you. So when we're abiding in Him, being in His Word, we will hear Him, and we will then have to the courage to obey Him. See, that is what we identify as the call. The call, now understand this, the call is the voice of God speaking to you directly in the natural and the supernatural. The call for your life right now is what God is saying and what He wants to to apply in your life. Now Moses was called when he was looking at a burning bush. Amazement will cause you to hear God. Or Joshua was called while grieving Moses because that's his leader and now he's dead and what does Joshua do? In grief, grief causes us to hear from God. Or how about John the Baptist when he received the call in the desert? Loneliness can cause us to hear God. Or how about Saul, who is later called Paul, otherwise St. Paul, received the call when he was riding a horse going to persecute Christians, and he was knocked from it. And he said, Master, who are you? Because God had blinded him. And he said, I'm Jesus whom you persecute. (laughs) The supernatural will certainly cause us to hear God. So the call can come from our thoughts or from another person, a divine messenger, an angel, but generally in this generation it's the Holy Spirit, or from within oneself. You know the Spirit of God. You know that that thought is deeper than just a head thought. That's a godly thought. And it brings a strong desire to spend your life that way, doing a certain kind of work or responding a certain way or accomplishing a certain mission in your life. It can be a life goal. It can be a life dream. We have things like that. People, we use that term. See, a lot of terms we use are biblically grounded. Like, for example, it'd be my life dream if, pay attention, My life dream, if. What is your true life dream? And you realize, what's my call? What's that have to do with me and God? 
and living for Him. See, what we are to do in this life comes from somewhere beyond us. It comes from God. We are each called to do something. Now listen, we are each called to do something. We are each selected and we are each chosen. And so we get to choose it or run away from it. But remember, the opposite of courage is apathy. Just don't do anything and you'll never be satisfied. How many times in our lives, people, and I got this on hospice chaplaincy on their deathbed, I wish I had. Now, ironically, thank God, I had many more. I led a good life. I had a blessed life. I even had ones I'm ready to go. I even had a few, a dozen, that said, why am I still here? You said I had 30 days, 60 days. You said I had a year. And, and they get angry with God. Why? They're ready to go. And so, how do we live our life? If I had only... See, when we hear the call and respond, there'll be no what ifs because we're confident of our relationship and obedience to God. I was reading Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He's a German pastor that stood against the Nazis and. Matter of fact, he started the confessing church, which is to confess the scriptures in all situations and stand against evil. And I have a picture of him in one of his books. I have two of them, and one was about him. And he's, uh, in his teaching, he says, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. And I'll say that again in just a minute. But I have a picture of him standing out of this little hut where they were marching men 10 days before the war was over. They're marching them, them in and hanging them one at a time. Now this man is a minister. He stood, he, he's got the movement of Christianity against the uh, Nazis and they're going to hang him. Uh, and he's standing there, his hands are tied and he's looking at the sky and you see this little hut house behind him. And he says, I quote, this is a good day to die. I can now start living. That man knew his call to stand against evil, to preach the gospel in all situations. But in his writing, when Christ calls a man, a woman, he bids him come and die. Otherwise, die to self. And we're, when we say die to self in Romans, we're talking about our old self being crucified. See, dying to yourself means to forego, forego the selfish physical, egotistical desires of this world, and wholeheartedly seek the kingdom of God. Doesn't mean you can't live in the world and enjoy everything God's created and given you. That, it has nothing, we're not talking about forsaking it all for Him, we're talking about a concept that we forsake it all for Him. And the purpose of God's call is to know Him, to believe Him, and obey Him to live for Him. And people, that's what you're doing. You're trying to hear God. You hear God's voice. You say, okay, this is where I'm living right now. This is His call in my life. But also, what's the greater call? <clears throat> we need a daily, weekly call. <clears throat> we need a seasonal call. But we also need to understand our life call. See, His call will cost you. But His call is what true living is all about. You've heard the saying, you haven't lived until you, and then you fill it in. And there's a lot of exciting ways to live. You haven't lived until you, you know, and again, that's biblically based. You haven't lived till you've heard God. You haven't lived till you've pleased God. You haven't lived until you've hurt, you know, and, and, it's, and, and so what do we do? We work that out. Everything in the natural is a spiritual truth this way. And God wants us to be able to say, hey, amen, you haven't lived until. And that's good because it's given us an insight of the happiness, the excitement, the satisfaction of what we can see and experience to what he wants us to see in the supernatural. And so the important thing is not to be afraid. When somebody says, you haven't lived until, there's always somebody that cringes. Had a couple, new couple visiting in my office yesterday, and they're looking at the hot air balloon picture, and she, she does this. She goes, oh, oh no, no. See, I said, oh, you haven't lived. <laughs> See, it, it's like, 
It's a natural response. It certainly can be a spiritual response. But see, courage is what God thinks of you. Fear is what others think of you. Courage is what God thinks of you. Fear is what others think of you. I was reading the Stoic philosopher Cicero this week, and here's a quote. Let other people worry over what they will say about you. They're, they will say it in any case. So I worry. What you want to know is what does God say about you? And long as he says, good, well done, good and faithful servant, you're in like Flynn. You're, you're a pleasing God, and there's nothing higher for the Christian life. So when you're ab abiding in God and his word, when you have the courage to answer his call, then life becomes exciting and absolutely satisfying. I've had both believers and non-believers debate and snicker, for example. When I started this church, really, you're going to do that? Or certainly when I started the motorcycle ministry, mocked about that. These are Christians that were in the church, not hearing God. Or when I brought minorities into this building, I talk about Sunday school, and talking about when God says, and I've been preaching it, Kevin, Melissa have been teaching it, a new thing. We've been saying that for about two years, and about a year now, it's starting to move, and a new thing doesn't mean more of the same. Hello? It doesn't mean what we already see. It means a new thing. It does not mean adding more to the same old thing. The call is moving this church. And so, the Father is glorified by bearing much fruit. When abiding in Christ and the courage to answer the call is being, for example, me and the Melchizedek's, does that really make sense? You know, you're a mature Christian. You're educated. Does that really make sense to go into biker world? Yes, because that's where God called me. How about Kevin in Pakistan? Does that really make sense? You've only seen her online. Yes, because he contacted and is in constant contact with her. Now, how about Julie in Papua New Guinea? Does that make sense? Well, we've seen Bill and Jennifer, so we feel kind of safe there. But we still don't know what's happening over there. Does that make sense? Yes, because they've heard God. How about Barb in Honduras? Does that make sense <laughs> at her age? Yeah, can I, 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 I share? So I won't get real personal. Barb has a, might, might have an operation coming in, and it would be intimidating. It is intimidating. But she heard about some relatives that had the same thing and got more energy. And, and matter of fact, one of them in their 90s got more, operation, got more energy, and now plays t uh, table tennis tournaments at 90 or 91. And, uh, and she said, so I, and I forgot how she worked. Or, well, I guess I have more time to serve. And I said, you better get busy, Moses. You know, when you hear God's call, you get happy. You get excited. I love picking up. I buy. I get soup every Monday night from Barb, and that's how she's raising more money for. Uh, just to listen to her. I mean, she's so excited about uh, Ginger, Mike, and Ginger coming. That you know, it's like why I had. She had the call, and she answered the call, and it affected all of us, and certainly affected them, and affected the people. Those homes, they're building them because of you, people. You're responding to the call in the church. And so when we look at that, we can have exciting, dynamic calls, but most calls are not drastic or dynamic. So let's bring it down a few notches, though I think that's drastic and dynamic. How about the call opens opportunities for you in the here and now in your life and opportunities to show mercy, uh, how about the call to show mercy? See, maybe it happens once or twice, and then it becomes a regular insight into your life, and you say, I have all these opportunities to show mer mercy. I've been called to show mercy. You see how that develops? Uh, how about a call um, to minister mercy, maybe hospital visits, or assisting sick people, or 
Here's Dick, or Donna and, and Barb, always having dinners presented. Before I even know somebody's sick and in the hospital, they've already got dinners being made. They've contacted the rest of you. That's a gift of showing mercy. That's a call in her life, in their lives. Well, how about the opportunities for the gift of works? See, they always seem to be available at the right time. Uh, you see that, the gift of works with Mark Reese and being the treasurer. You know what it takes to be the treasurer of a church and keep track of all the finances and, and now uh, taxes coming at the end. He's got to figure all that up for everybody. Or how about Wendy yesterday? Dear old Wendy, there she is right in the thick of it again. Wendy and Lewis. And then who does she have? J Joe and Kim helping and Chris helping. And, and they put up all the declarations and upstairs you ought to see it. And, and there's the gift of works or the call to works. And how about what is closely related and overlapping is the gift of helps. You see the opportunity. I can do that. I can help. And, and, and somehow you just always seem to be available when the gift of helps, the call, needs you. And you realize, wait a minute, I've been called for helps. I've been called for mercy. I've been called for serving. I, that's a call. That's not just an idea. And when we look at that and realize that there you are, I saw that yesterday all through the church with these people. Check the nine attributes of the Holy Spirit in Galatians 5 and what has developed and how you can identify your call. See, when you have love, joy, peace, and patience, that is developed by your gift and your call using kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And what happens, that helps you develop your call. Your call opens doors. And your call is what you just naturally do and are satisfied with God about it. Your call gives opportunities that nothing else will open that door. But God knows. You He's called you, and you'll respond, so He opens the doors for you. Or let's look at some of our own families. How about, you know, differences in children? And you always know the peacemaker. Most every family can say, oh, we had a, out of, out of the four of us, out of the five of us, we had a peacemaker. That's a call. And that needs to be developed so that peacemaker can go out into the world and make peace. And, and you say, well, how do I do that? Who knows? But if you say, if the family can identify that in you, my wife has a sister whose husband is actively declining. He's right at that, you know, sick, actively declining, actively dying dead. He's right at that curve. And so... He fell in the tub and, you know, he, he, so weak, he, you know, it's not good. He's dying of cancer. And she said this morning, uh, she was talking to her last night, and she said, I cry all the time. And so Kathy's encouraging her and preparing her and telling her, look, you, you know that you're doing everything you can. It's wearing her out. You know, you're, <laughs> it's killing you how you're helping him. You're doing everything a good wife can do. And then she says, thanks for calling. So she goes from crying to encouragement to laughing. If Kathy can do anything, she can make people laugh. And so she, then her sister says before they hang up, thanks for calling because you always make me laugh. People, there, there's a call to that. There's a call to that. Kathy's called to help widows during their affliction and or right before they become a widow. And what happens? She's ministering life and ministering life to the point she gets them to laugh when there's no laughing matter. How do you do that? The call is what she has. So the call opens doors for the gifts that you have. People, now this is, <laughs> catch this, okay? Find the gift, find the call. Find your gift, find your call. Most of you already know what that is. But maybe you need to expand it. Or maybe you say, okay, that was good for now, but now what? Ask God, and He will give that to you because He understands you will use it.
And it will generally be what gives you a zeal for a living, what gives you a satisfaction. We're going to see next Sunday Mike and Ginger Green from Honduras. Watch them to see if they, to, to, to just listen to them. We're going to interview them so that so we get a lot of uh, questions answered. Just listen to them and, and see if, if you don't understand, if you don't see the abiding in him and the courage that it takes, as well as the risk and the in investment and ultimately the satisfaction. You'll see their call for the love for those people over in Honduras. You'll see the commitment that they have for those people in Honduras. And most of all, you'll see the satisfaction of them because they answered the call. And people, all of you, help them. So you're part of that call. Every one of us have a call. He has called those that love him. Why? Love, love, love. He wants to show you how much he loves you so you can pass it through you with his call to others. Let's stand for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We get to celebrate your birth all this month. Lord, let it be the best month we've ever had as a church. Let it be the best month we've had as families, that you'd work in every family, the joy and peace, the righteousness of Jesus Christ. We thank you for that. So Lord, we pray, anyone here who's never said Jesus, I want that kind of Jesus that they would say, Jesus, come into my life right now. I give myself to you. I receive you. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you for this month of celebration. In Christ's name, amen. Pastor Mark Ammerman, and I want to thank you for being with us today, and I certainly hope you are blessed. I want to invite you to live stream to the pastor's study on Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, for a short message out of the Word of God, where God can lead you, guide you, comfort you, strengthen you in your life at this time. So again, thank you for being here, and I hope to see you Wednesday and Sundays.